In my business, you prepare for the unexpected. And what business is that? I help people with problems. Problem solver. I'm more of a problem eliminator. Dalton's second and final performance as James Bond would be in 1989's License to Kill. Here's my candidate for most underrated Bond film. I think it's a great one on all levels, and not just as a Bond film, but also as an action film. The original title was to have been License Revoked. The common misconception for the title change was because the studio found most Americans didn't know what the word revoked meant. Maybe there was some truth to that. However, it was because mainly Americans associated the original title with driving privileges. I suppose it's a rational explanation, but I can't imagine anyone mistaking this film as a sequel to that movie that starred the Corys. The film was initially planned to be set in China, with Bond facing off with a Chinese drug lord. Filmmakers wanted to send Bond to a location the series really hadn't taken him yet. There had been planned numerous sequences to take advantage of the location. A motorcycle chase on the Great Wall of China, and a fight in a Chinese museum. However, demands made by the Chinese government over the script made the filmmakers decide on another option. The film was eventually set in the fictitious country of the Republic of Isthmus. The story would focus on 007's personal vendetta against a powerful drug lord. Operating on his own, he would seek revenge on him and his whole empire. This would be the darkest film yet the series would venture into. The film opens with Bond and Felix making their way to Felix's wedding. Bond is the best man. Before they get very far, Felix is notified the drug lord, Franz Sanchez, is in the Bahamas, and they have an opportunity to catch him. Not missing a beat, Felix and Bond are off. Robert Davies Sanchez has a very cool introduction. It's quickly clear he's going to be a violent adversary from his first scene. Bond doesn't get to face too many villains that look as equal physically, and Davi fits the part. It can get kind of boring for Bond to just face bad guys who sit behind a desk and push buttons all the time. Immediately, Sanchez orders his heavies to cut out a guy's heart and proceeds to whip Lupe, played by Talcia Soto. What follows is a very cool opening sequence of Bond capturing Sanchez's plane before he and Felix parachute right down to the wedding. Very cool. It's established that Felix and Bond obviously have a closer relationship than just professional. Him being the best man at the wedding is a clear sign of it, and Felix's bride, Della, is also fond of him. It's clear they hang out a bit more socially than what we've seen in previous films. The best man gift that's given to him by the couple, an engraved lighter, is another telling indication of their relationship with him, along with the setup of the finale of the film. I like the one parting note of Felix mentioning to Della that Bond was married once. It obviously remains a delicate topic to Bond, who flatly refuses to catch Della's garter. I like that the filmmakers kept that continuity of the history of the character alive. Whereas in past films, the character of Felix was basically there to give Bond information or use for exposition purposes, here he becomes the catalyst for the story and Bond's motivation. Sanchez manages a simple but effective escape and seeks out Felix. His henchmen capture him, leaving behind Della, who was killed after apparently being raped. With Sanchez facing the man who is causing him problems, he remarks that what's about to happen is just business, nothing personal. Felix is lowered into an awaiting shark. Although he survives, he loses a leg and his arm gets badly maimed. It's a pretty twisted scene. The series had used sharks before, but I think this one is certainly the most brutal. It's a powerful catalyst for what motivates Bond. The scene is memorable and echoes throughout the rest of the film. Up to this point, the character of Felix had appeared in seven Bond films, all played by different actors. License to Kill would mark the first time the character is played by a returning actor, David Hedison. He had played Felix 16 years earlier in 1973's Live and Let Die. I always thought it was somewhat a missed opportunity that the series hadn't kept one actor in the recurring role of Felix. An actor could have made the part his own, as Desmond Llewellyn, Lois Maxwell, and Bernard Lee had done with their roles. I'm not sure why the role of Felix became a game of musical chairs. Admittedly, it might not have been a huge part in each film, but still I would think most actors would welcome the opportunity of being attached to the franchise. I mean, just for the attention alone they would get. In all past outings, Felix worked for the CIA. 
This time out, though, he's working alongside the DEA. Fans of the novels can comment on how the books continued with the character Felix after this shark attack and the repercussions of it, but I'm just going to stick with the movies. I do like the twisted note left with Felix that Bond finds. That too is taken directly from the novel Live and Let Die. So Bond is unhappy with the laws the DEA has to follow and them just resigning themselves that Sanchez is out of their jurisdiction and there's little left to do. He sets out on his own to exact revenge on Sanchez for Felix and Della. Bond and Felix's fisherman buddy, Sharky, start their own investigation and they discover the spot where Felix was taken. Here is where he first meets Milton Crest. You can just tell right away some guys in movies are bad and this guy just looks weaselly. When Bond returns, a suspense-filled shootout happens. The marine setting is utilized for some fun stuff and Bond and Sharky manage to get a hold of Killifer. Just his name sounds like trouble. The one guy who betrayed Felix and helped Sanchez escape. Dalton is at his cold best, just being expressionless as he watches Kilfer get killed by the shark, not lifting a finger to help. There are little throwaway details I dig in this film. Bond using his Universal Exports cover, him spotting Felix's carnation, Bond casually putting the lobster in a tank as he's sneaking around from the guard. Tiny things that go by fast, but add some flavor to the film. Before Bond sets out to find Crest's boat, the wave crest, he is intercepted by Hawkins, Felix's DEA associate. Kind of funny that he, along with Robert Davi, played the Johnson agents in Die Hard a year earlier. At the Hemingway house, M threatens Bond to get to Istanbul for his next mission. Bond refuses and, inevitably, his license to kill gets revoked. It's a nice scene and it's clear M wouldn't have any major qualms about having him killed. The only reason he doesn't is too many witnesses. As Bond and Sharky track down the wave crest, Bond deploys an inventive disguise to avoid detection. It's a believable and creative solution. I mean, it's not like Roger Moore in a plastic crocodile. The film sets up the submersible that will play a part in the upcoming action, along with the pool that Bond will use to slip aboard the boat undetected in the upcoming scenes. Bond discovers Lupe, who is seemingly more of a prisoner than a lover of Sanchez. As Bond sees that Sharky was discovered and killed, it sets up one of the more exciting Bond action set pieces in recent films. The director, John Glenn, who had directed every Bond film since Free Eyes Only, I think really knows how to build up to a good action sequence. We're slowly introduced to the geography and the components, and when things start to happen, it's an escalating progression to a fun ride. As more and more henchmen begin to look for him, Bond discovers the drugs in the submersible which leads to a funny unexpected reveal to Crest. Divers quickly descend on him and the editing of the underwater fight make it much more exciting than previous ones the series had done. Bond water skiing beyond the seaplane is unexpected and leads to a thrilling getaway as he coolly makes off with a plane full of money, just leaving the bad guys behind staring and wondering what the heck just happened. Very cool stuff. By a mayor, chief of police, general. By the way, the film does include director John Glenn's signature animal scare. Something that shows up in all the Bond films he directed. We eventually meet Bond's leading lady, Pam Bouvier, played by Carrie Lowell. There's always this declaration by Bond girls that they don't want to just be eye candy and want to be a strong, independent woman, more of Bond's equal. And I think she actually fulfills the requirements. She's obviously tough, knows how to fight, fly a plane and all that. Plus, she's really hot. Every time I watch this film, I'm mesmerized by Carrie Lowell's gams with her hidden gun in the garter. The romance from The Living Daylights isn't really present here. It's more of a traditional Bond girl role. But I think she's one of the better ones and fulfills the role nicely. We also get a closer introduction to Dario, played by Benicio Del Toro. He's one of Sanchez's main henchmen, and he's a pretty slimy character, and exudes mean with his creepy smile and all that. In fact, Sanchez has a pretty diverse group of followers. It's an interesting casting decision. They're not the usual type of henchmen you'd expect to find in the inner circle of a Bond villain. They're not these big burly guys who look dangerous and threatening. Here, this group of guys look more like just hangers-on. 
I can almost imagine that most of them are working for him because they knew him when he was nothing, stood by his side and coasted along with him for a free ride. A nice hint that they got their positions because their loyalty has secured them a place in Sanchez's trust. 